I use photography as a way to help me understand why I am here. The camera helps me to see. I am forever chasing light. Light turns the ordinary into the magical. Hey, welcome to the Street Shots Photography Podcast. This is Antonio, and this is episode 197 for the middle of December 2023. And you can tell it's just me today. Ward sends his regrets. He is unable to make it to the show tonight. So you're going to have to just deal with me. <laughs> and I realized this is the first time in a while that I did the, I'm doing the show by myself. And so I'm kind of at a loss because I'm usually, I'm not used to talking to myself, to you <laughs> in a while. You know, it's good to have uh, someone on the other side to discuss ideas and stuff like that with, but I thought I'd give it a try. I do want to put a show out for the middle of the month and, you know, um, anyway, uh, sorry that, uh, Ward isn't here and uh, hopefully he'll join us for the, you know, the, uh, this is the penultimate of the year and hopefully for the, uh, fine finale of the year episode. And, but I do have a cat here who wants to talk. So you may hear him speaking. Uh, I had to raise my desk up so that I'm standing. Otherwise he would uh, jump in front of my, uh, or you jump on my desk and get in the way. So we all know that Opie is very interested in being, I don't know where he is now. I don't want to step on him. Uh, he took off. He wants to be on the show all the time. Uh, he needs to become a, you know, he needs to become a union member <laughs> anyway. Sorry. So this might be a, a slightly uh, abridged, uh, sorry, uh, it might be a slightly less long show. Um, I wasn't sure. I had something in, in mind with Ward. We'll, we'll probably bring it up for the next episode. So it was kind of a little bit of a scramble to try to figure out what I want to talk about. So I'll just talk about a bunch of little mishmash, mixed up stuff. Um, I was watching YouTube to try to find something to riff off of and my, my YouTube algorithm is now set for um, notebooks and fountain pens. Uh, I've recently got into uh, a fountain pen habit. Uh, I don't know where this came from. Actually, I do know. I think I know where it came from, but I've been watching and absorbing YouTube videos on notebooks and fountain pens and inks and whatever. And I have a small collection that I've started of fountain pens. Actually, the majority of them were given to me as gifts. Uh, and although I did go on a little bit of a spending spree this week to buy a few more, um, just because I, I don't know, I wanted to try to get something that I might like. And again, it's with, with, um, with, uh, fountain pens, it's a very personal thing. And as I'm finding out through all the YouTube videos and, uh, so anyway, I'm, uh, I'm buying these, these notebooks with the nice paper and then I'm getting the inks and, and stuff like that. So I, so I was going to look for something to talk about and there's nothing, there's nothing there. I was, I swear I was scanning all my, my, my feeds in, in YouTube and I couldn't find anything in photography. I'd have to go to the subscriptions and stuff like that, but it wasn't bringing anything up, which is fine because, you know, I'm in this mode of, uh, writing. But what I was saying before is I know where it's coming from because we had talked about on the show doing things like a photo journal and the photomancy in the last episode, which requires a bit of writing and stuff like that. So I have been creating notebooks for doing these things. I have a photo journal, which I try to use as much as possible. That's also where I include my photomancy stuff. I've only done one so far. I told you guys in the last episode, what I did with the uh, picture of the cat. Uh, I still am, you know, figuring this system out. And I it, actually in the past couple of weeks, I haven't, um, taken advantage of it or haven't really tried it again. Uh, but, um, wanting to be able to write in a book uh, with nice paper and, and have the pen feel good because it's all conducive to writing. If everything is, the paper is nice and smooth and the pen is writing nice and smooth, it makes me want to write. And so anyway, I'm doing that. And also in the, in the photo journal, I'm also, you know, pulling up regular pictures and writing about them. And again, it's more about, you know, sitting there and contemplating and thinking about the pictures and writing and writing and writing and having good tools 
for writing is important. Now, you know, someone might argue that fountain pens are over the top and maybe, but the, you know, I don't really have any hobbies. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I, well, I do have a couple, but I don't really indulge them. I've got, uh, I play tabletop games and I got a few others, but I don't really, it's not, I don't know. Something about those others that just are just like, well, they're more collections, I should say, uh, in a way. But uh, and, and, and fountain pens are a collection as well. But there's something about using them. You know, not only am I collecting them, but I'm using them. And I'm, I think I'm more into the usage rather than the collection. Like, although there are some really beautiful ones. I've been watching these uh, very expensive ones being displayed on some of the YouTube videos. There's one that's made out of um, volcanic basalt, <laughs> which has been ground up. And then encoded, uh, uh, coated in resin, or actually mixed with resin to create the mold for the, for the for the pen. And I was like, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful pen. I looked at the price, and it's like close to eight hundred dollars. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not in that realm yet. I, I really am just looking for a for good pens that write smoothly. And somebody a while back on on Twitter, uh, a, a Twitter friend who recently passed away, I found out, but she had uh, sent me a small collection of pens to try out. i um, just out of the blue. It was like a, a gift. And, and those have actually been sitting in my pen drawer for a little while. And, and once I started getting into this, uh, this writing with nice pen thing, uh, I pulled those out and I cleaned them and I put ink in them. And I was like, Oh, this, and then I found another one that someone else gave me in a box someplace. And I was like, I already had four nice pens. And uh, so I've been using them in the journals and the photo journals and, and some other journals that I've got. And again, you know, something about writing with longhand, you know, it's kind of like akin to photographing, you know, using, I don't know, people say when you use film, you're slowing up and whatnot, but you know, that's all debatable. But anyway, but in the same sense that, you know, photographing, with film or a manual focus camera or manual focus lens slows you down, maybe spends more time looking at the images and stuff like that. Where you're about to photograph the writing in a book with a nice pen feels kind of the same, at least for my mind, you know, that uh, my, my thoughts come out maybe a little bit more, uh, maybe less jumbled, I should say. And, you know, I have to make that connection between my mind and the paper and the pen. And uh, my, my handwriting is, terrible by the way i actually just bought a book on on i want to start to build up my uh relearn my cursive writing again because i like cursive uh it's it's nice especially with a good pen where you're actually you know one word is is essentially one line that you just sort of drag across the paper i write in block type and it looks terrible and, and but using a, a fountain pen or a really nice pen on nice paper really is conducive to trying to make your make my uh handwriting look nicer so I, I bought this book on cursive so i'm going to practice that anyway sorry sorry this is not the direction i want to go in i just sort of we're telling you uh what's going on so yeah fountain pens youtube no photography that i could find a riff off of so i'm just sort of off the top of my head where you know in the united states where uh well everywhere else i guess who celebrates christmas we're we're not too far away from it but you know a couple of weeks away and, you know, uh, maybe I was thinking maybe I could talk about gifts to get or give. And I was like, eh, you know, it's hard to give gifts to photographers or ask people to get gifts for photographers because so much of the stuff that we want is expensive. I would never have, you know, say, well, you know, I'd like I'd like that lens for Christmas. You know, I'd never do that. You know, so I wasn't sure about what to talk about for gifts. Of course, one of the things I like to talk about, one of the things I've been uh, I've always put on my list for gifts, especially when, uh, when my wife wanted to buy me a gift, I would put an Amazon book list together and she bought me a lot of photo books over time. And I always liked that. Even though I was choosing the ones I want, I would choose a big selection of them. So I wouldn't know which one she would get me. And I think books are a really nice gift to give and certainly a nice gift to buy for yourself. And, and of course, you know me and Ward. We're talking about photo books all the time, and I, bl I still blame him. If he's li Ward, you're listening. I know you're listening. I don't blame you, but I blame you <laughs> for this. You know, um, getting me rekindled into into photo books, and I, I I really enjoy them. So I always think that's a nice gift. So I, anyway, I wanted to talk about a couple of books that I got, and I thought you know, just share them with you. They they came in the mail in the past week. 
And uh, the first one I want to talk about was um, actually I bought them from this place called Photo Bookstore. So photobookstore.co.uk. So uh, a photo bookstore in the United Kingdom. In, in, um, actually, I don't know where it is, but it's, in, it's got a UK URL. And uh, I, I'm, I can't remember how I got turned on to this place, which was not good for me because there was a lot of books there that I want. A lot of books are out of print and stuff like that. And they might have gotten, I don't know, maybe a friend told me about this place. And uh, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> Just don't tell me about this. So I was looking around, but I had gotten uh, wind of a book uh, from a photographer called, uh, his name is Martin Amos, A-M-I-S. And the book is called Closed. And uh, the first thing that attracted me, of course, was the cover. It's just a, a looks like a, it's a kind of a green uh, canvas or sort of fabric book cover with a black keyhole on it. So there's no photograph. Right? It's just this uh, black keyhole silhouette. And uh, I looked at some of the pictures in the samples, and it immediately reminded me of the um, book that we were talking about with the photographers James and Carla Murray from a few episodes ago called Storefront, and how they were recording the stores in New York City, the five boroughs, uh, and making sure that there was some record of them. And she was also talking about how many of them were closing and whatnot. This book is is what I would call it like sort of the after effect of storefront. These are uh, photo photos of um, r stores and businesses that have closed in the UK. So I'm just going to read a little bit of the um, the description of this book so that you can get it. So instead of me trying to just parse it, uh, uh, I'll just read it directly. If I can do this correctly. Okay. Across the UK, town centers are undergoing a major transformation. Over the past decade, empty storefronts have become an increasingly familiar sight as businesses disappear from our high streets, leaving an atmosphere of uncertainty in their wake. In 2021 alone, more than 17,000 stores shut down nationwide. The combined result of the growth of out-of-town retail, the rise of megastores, and more recently, a shift towards online sh shopping all exasperated by a global pandemic. While working on his previous project, This Land, Martin Amos noticed the prevalence of closed premises and began to explore this phenomenon further. Between 2019 and 2022, Amos photographed closed shops across Kent, gradually building a picture of how British towns are being reshaped by the decline of the high street, from pubs post offices, bookshops, to new agent, news agents and social clubs, these spaces once served a vital role for communities. Focusing on the overlooked elements and architectural details, Amos captured the multiple layers of these buildings as they have morphed over the years, each revealing signs of social change. So when I, when I read that and I saw the pictures, I immediately thought of the Murrays and what they're doing. And in some sense, I was also thinking about the project that I'm working on, or I'm kind of finished with, uh, the 11218 plus the pictures in my neighborhood, that all sort of came together. So uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. I'll just describe the book. There's not going to be a totally a, a book review. Uh, I, I, I don't want to do that I'm now just on a, um, you know, <laughs> on a sort of uh, improvised podcast show. But I do want to describe the book. First of all, it's really interesting because it's a spiral bound book with a um, not kind of binding this is called, but it looks like a notebook. So right, when you open it up, it's got the spirals on the inside. Actually, when the book is closed, you can only see the, the spirals on the uh, spine of the book. It's not along the, the front like a like a notebook would. But when you open it up, it lies flat and it's spiral bound. So I'm really curious why. Uh, the photographer and publisher chose to do a spiral bound book. I've, I don't think I have a photo book that is spiral bound. So it's, it's interesting. Um, and I'm still thinking about this, but all the photographs are black and white and they are square format. Uh, most pages just have one picture. There are some double, some double pages. Uh, there's no spreads. Um, they're just like two separate pictures. One's, you know, one after the other. And, um, it's a fairly simple black and white, um, the black and white imagery, 
But what I'm noticing is that these stores are, the way they're closed, a lot of them look like they've been um, really put through the ringer, you know? And again, it made me think about, you know, the the photographs that the Murrays were photographing. And they, they were taking pictures of the stores while they were open. And they did discuss on our show and in their book um, how many of those places have closed, but they don't photograph the closed place. They photograph the open place. And I think it's an, it's an interesting um, mix because in one case, I think like the Murrays are working towards optimism and using the pictures for, you know, some way to uh, educate and say, you know, these are the kind of places we have and be ashamed to lose them. And Amos here is showing the inevitable after results. It's like he's following in their footsteps. Of course, he's doing it in England and not in uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn and, and the five boroughs. But I can just imagine the stores that the Murrays are talking about in these photographs that Amos is showing in the UK. So I, it was, it was, a it was sort of a, like I'd never seen this guy's work before. Uh, and it was also a signed book. So I got, I got this one signed by him, which is kind of nice as well. But I really, there's something about this, um, these stores, this record of, of capturing things that are going away and, and, and may not ever come back. You know, I mean, online shopping and mega stores and stuff like that, they're not going anywhere. And I can't imagine that, uh, you know, uh, what's interesting is, hey, I bought these books. <laughs> using online stores. The, the photo bookstore is an online store. And so I didn't go to a photo bookstore in, in New York. And actually there aren't any, uh, I'd, I'd have to, I'd, I'd probably not even know about this book had I not found it on the internet or, or, or gone to this uh, website. So there's a, there's a little bit of an irony here, you know, but, um, yeah, online stores are, are here to stay. I mean, you know, buying these books on Amazon and stuff like that. And, you know, here are these, these records of places. Oh, wow. Here's a picture of a Woolworths there. I didn't know they had a Woolworths in Kent. Um, you know, seeing these, these places after they've closed and are probably never going to come back. They're never going to come back. The M and M kebab pizza burger house and busy bees and clock owner news. I mean, the, the news agents, the, those places are never going to come back. They're going to turn into something. The good luck. Oh, here's one that's interesting. Good luck. Chinese restaurant, totally closed and boarded up. This kind of stuff is not coming back. And, and I, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, there's, there's it's probably a longer discussion better with uh, somebody else. And maybe, maybe, maybe I can get Amos on the show someday and, and talk about this. That'd be kind of great to have that. Um, the, the compelling desire for photographers like, like Amos and the Murray's and even me in some case to, to document and record these places is, is i mean it's admirable and it's um you know necessary i believe and there's some bit of there's a lot of sadness to it because we are taking pictures of things that are no longer going to be here and in 20 years nobody's going to know that these places didn't exist i mean unless someone picks up these books and looks at them you know whatever fills in these these empty stores and businesses that are shutting down are going to be nothing like what they were before and the people who are uh, will be alive in those times won't necessarily know or, or even care about what was there. So I don't know. I find it pr particularly poignant um, that, uh, that uh, the, both of these books are sort of on my shelf now and it's, and it's, and it's kind of like a before and after thing. And uh, I don't know. Like, Oh, you know, in, in that regard, I, I did a photo talk or I did a, I would call it an artist talk at the, coffee shop that I have my show up in. And I, can't, I actually can't even remember if I talked about this in the last episode. Uh, maybe I did. I don't want to repeat myself, but in the, you know, in that whole process uh, of talking, what, what, what I was trying to do is get people to, I was using my pictures, but I was trying to get people to think about documenting the place that they live in. And uh, because that's going to give us, and it's going to give future generations an idea of what, what, was there, what might be missing, what's something to long for, what's maybe something to sort of go back towards, you know, if we have these documented records. But anyway, on uh, one of the avenues around me is called Coney Island Avenue. And uh, there's this place that is painted. It's an auto. It was an auto 
body shop or something like that. And it was painted this bright blue. And there was this uh, painted genie on the top. I can't remember the name of the place, Rays or something like that. It was like cartoon genie. And they have this very, very bright, like ultra crazy red door uh, that leads into the place. And they, they did some red trim on the windows and stuff like that. But then there was this graffiti on the top of the windows that with the um, not graffiti painting of the genie and the name of the store. And I've taken a lot of pictures of it because it's just compelling to photograph the colors and, and whatnot, especially close ups of the door. But I was, you know, usually across the street, you can see the whole building. Anyway, I was walking down the street about a week ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, some, somebody new had moved into that place. I mean, there, I think there was another construction company moving in using it as a warehouse or something like that. Anyway, there was a guy painting over all the, the, the genie and the name of the place, which of course makes sense because it's no longer this Ray's auto glass place or whatever it is. It's now this warehouse. And he was essentially using a very similar color blue paint to what was there already. And just painting over the the genie and the name of the place and, and essentially erasing the name of what was there and erasing this, you know, this artwork that was on there. And I took some pictures of the guy uh, doing that. And I thought, again, here's here's a uh, an obvious, you know, something that was there and is now being literally erased. Now, I actually put that up on the local Facebook groups where I post my pictures of my neighborhood. And, you know, I said, look, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. You know, I was like, this is kind of what I was talking about in my talk. And there was a few comments that came in and saying, oh, that's a shame and blah, blah, blah. And then someone came on and said, those guys ripped me off. So, you know, good riddance to them, right? Essentially, whoever this person was had maybe taken their car there and had a bad experience. And so they were happy to see that being erased and someone else came on and said the same thing. And, and luckily it didn't get too dicey. I post a picture like that in the, in my, uh, in my Facebook group. And uh, that could bring up a lot of, uh, you know, there could be a lot of uh, arguments and stuff like that, but it didn't, it didn't go that much. It didn't go farther than that, which I was happy about, but it did make me think about like, you know, here I am walking by this thing and saying, it's a shame that this is, happening. And I know this is going to happen because this is progress and this is someone moves in and they repaint their house and it's no longer the same thing and blah, blah, blah. And, and now it's gone. Right. And here's a, here's a person who's got the opposite or, you know, has a different idea about the place and saying, you know, yeah, good riddance that they're being erased from, you know, the, the world. And it's just two different ways of looking at the same thing. And again, the result is though, there was something there a few weeks ago and now it's gone. No longer is it there. So anybody who walked by that, who came to the neighborhood for the first time or is driving by, they'll just see a blue building and they won't know what was there prior to that. And that, is that important? I don't know. It, you know, it, it, I don't want to say it's important to me, but it's, again, it's part of the documenting of the history of the neighborhood. There was something there and then now it's gone. And you could say that for a lot of places, you know, restaurants and stores and, whatever, you know, street corners, fire hydrants. I mean, there's a million things that, that could be there one day and that can be uh, gone the next. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, why do you want a court? Who cares about this stuff? And, and that's true. I don't, you know, why do I care about the genie being painted over? But, uh, you know, if we, if we said that about everything, then we would not document history. We would not take snapshots. We wouldn't write things down in journals. You know, I think the human race has a, has a desire to, to have a history, you know, however petty or small it might be or insignificant, you know, we, we remember giant events, you know, you know, world events, those are the big things, but, but also the small stuff makes a difference. So this idea of keeping track of things that exist and then don't exist is, is something not everybody should do, you know, it's not necessary, but I think that uh, some of us like who are photographers who care about the stuff or who desire to, you know, keep a record of what is here and what is gone and, and make sure that people understand this stuff, that, that this is something that, that we ought to pay attention to and let the, let the future generations figure it out, whether or not it's important or not, you know, um, but let's, let's keep doing this, you know? And so as we're, as we're getting close to the closing of the year, 
you know, something to think about for the next year that's coming on, not as a, you know, new, new year's resolution, but, you know, thinking that as the, as the world progresses and how much of this stuff do we want to keep track of? Uh, anyway, just something for you to, 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 to keep in mind. Okay. The next thing is I did get another book from, let me just find it. Where did I just put it? Oh, here it is. So this one, <clears throat> yeah, excuse me. Let me just get a sip of water here. This one I bought because, well, first of all, let me tell you what it is. Let me just get it on screen first. So I know what I'm talking about. It's a book called Monument uh, from Trent Park. Okay. And Again, um, this is not going to be a book review. And so, well, I'll talk about it a lot, but it's not going to be a, an in-depth book review. I'm just going to give you some first impressions about it. But uh, we had a listener ask us, and um, excuse me if I'm forgetting your name. I think you contacted Gward and uh, asked him, and I just can't remember who you were. But uh, someone said, you know, you guys talk about Trent Park, right? And I was like, uh, I'm not a big I wasn't on my radar Trent Park although a couple times he popped up on you know videos on YouTube and whatnot but then after uh, we were asked to to talk about him I, I started to dive into his work a little bit and of course for me to dive into a photographer's work I'd like to get a book uh, it's it's really hard to to make any kind of systematic kind of thought process or you know anything a, you know, getting a feeling about somebody by just looking at pictures on the internet. You can get, you know, it's just not, I don't know, for me, it doesn't feel right. You know, if I see a show or even like a handful of prints that are presented by the photographer or a book, I get a, I get a better feel for it. So anyway, uh, Trent Park popped up and I started looking for books and so many of his books are, are sold out. And, or if you're trying to get them, they're really expensive. They're collector's items. And I was like, damn, and I started looking at some of the samples online of the books and I was like, mm, this guy's work. I don't know. It's starting to, it's starting to resonate with me. I don't know. It's just, I really like it anyway. <laughs> so I was, uh, I'm not sure how this popped up on my, my feed, but the photo bookstore was announcing that uh, one of his books called monument was about to go into a second printing. And I, I went and looked and it's a bit pricey. Uh, the book was $129, but it's the, it's the, it's still the first edition, first edition, but it's the second printing because the first one sold out and, uh, it hadn't been out yet. And so I put my name on it. And I was like, I'm, I'm ordering this book. And of course I was looking at the pictures, uh, you know, some of the samples in the book and I already have an inkling of what his work is like. So I'm already intrigued by it. And anyway, this book came in the mail. It's called Monument. And to just describe it, it's a soft, soft hardcover. It's the best way to describe it. Not like a paperback. The the front cover, the book itself is is feels like a hardcover, but it's soft. And on the uh, sort of imprinted on the front of the book are little bits and pieces from the uh, if you know the plaque or record that they put on, I want to get this right. Is it on Voyager, I believe, mm, with the human figures and um, the sort of a representation of our stars and stuff like that? Well, that's kind of embossed on this cover, and then and the book also came with a metal plaque that's in the style of like a NASA plaque that they might have might tack onto the uh, lunar module. It says Monument Trent Park. It's metal. 2023 AD Stanley Barker are the are the uh, is the publisher. Anyway, it's a it's a 200 it's almost a 300 page book. And the pages uh, when you look at the um, side and and top and the uh, Top and bottom side, the pages are black, so it's not white. In fact, the entire book, it's black and white. The photography is black and white. Uh, let me just read to you 
I'll just read to you what's on the description here. I mean, you know, I'll put the link in the in the uh, in the show notes, but I'll put this. I'll just read this so you can get a idea of what we're looking at. Uh, Trent Park's landmark publication monument is a partial. Sorry, is it? Uh, let me start this again. Trent Park's landmark publication monument is a portal through which we bear witness to the disintegration of the universe over 294 expertly printed pages. The monolithic publication is bound in leather bearing totemic coordinates to the planet Earth, blind stamped end sheets, black sprayed edges, and a loose steel plaque that once removed leaves the volume without language. Uh, let me just, well, I'll just read this whole thing. When Trent Park moved to Sydney from a small Australian county town, country town, his first impression was of the sheer volume of people. He would grab his camera and go out exploring at every opportunity, fascinated by the endless processions. At rush hour, he watched as the city workers moved in a great mass, all walking the great conveyor belt of life. In a trance-like state, treading the same path day after day, week after week, year after year, clocking on, clocking off, all under the spell of the city, Park would stand on the edge of the wave on the outside of a new world, looking in as if watching a newly discovered species. Uh, anyway, there's a quote by Trent Park there. I'll, I'll let you guys read that one because it's actually something I, I just want to talk about. My first impressions of this book. It's interesting because I never, I didn't read this. Uh, I didn't read this summary of the book before I ordered it. Right. I just added it to the cart and I was like, I'm done. Right. So I'm only reading it now for the first time, but it's interesting that Monument, he says, Monument is a portal through which we bear witness to the disintegration of the universe over 294 expertly printed pages. Uh, first of all, they are expertly printed. Uh, and there is a, it's very, very unique. Um, uh, it, it's a very visceral book. I mean, first of all, it's heavy. It's large. Uh, it's about, oh, here we go. I can measure it for you. If I'm going to be technical, it's 10 inches by about 12 and a half. So it's a big book, 300 pages. But the first thing you notice, the first thing I noticed, I should say, because it's not about your experience, but my experience, is you can smell the printing of the book. And it, and it's a really, it's a very, very chemically, chemical smell. Um, I can't, just, can't quite describe it. Let's see. It's almost like clay and... Or, or, or not clay, uh, silly putty, if, not silly putty, what's that stuff called? Play-Doh. Play-Doh and, and some sort of petrochemical or something. And I'm sure that has something to do with the printing, the the, the ink and whatnot. It's a, the book is black and white. The pages are full bleed pages. Uh, there's some double page spreads. The black in this book in the printing is just insane. You can, I mean, that's probably what I'm smelling is the black ink in it because there is so much of it. Um, so it's anyway, so there's a very physical reaction and I had opening the book, but I sat and I went through the entire book one page at a time. I don't usually do that. Sometimes, you know, when you get a, I get a new book, I just sort of flip through it. This one I started from the beginning. Oh, what's interesting also in it is that there is writing in it, but it's in Braille. So the, the end paper and the beginning paper, what it was called, the end papers on uh, both the front of the book and the back of the book, are in Braille. And I have no idea how to figure this out because I don't read Braille. But there's some, you know, y immediately you know you have to, you're, you're feeling this book. So you're already I got my sense of smell, uh, my sense of touch in it, of course my eyesight in it as well, you know, and then I, I'm not quite going to taste the book, obviously. <laughs> That's not what I'm going to do. I'll just give you my impression of this book. First of all, I, I think it's definitely worth the $129 plus shipping. Uh, it came all the way from the UK. It's beautiful, you know, it's not damaged, whatnot. I think it was worth every single penny. And having not really gone through Trent Park's work in this way, uh, first of all, I will say now I'm a fan of this guy's work this is amazing. Uh, and if this was my first introduction to him in this, in using this book, um, I, you know, I don't know what to say this. I, I went through this from beginning to end and, and it is a, to me, the story of the universe, um, all wrapped up into, into 300 pages. And that includes the, the story of the universe, according to human beings, right? 
but there is this progression through the book from like the beginning of time to the end of time. And as I went through each page and it's really, it's sequenced so nicely. Um, it, it's, I can't, you know, it's a, it's a masterful sequenced book. Um, the black and white photography is, is important to the story because the, the black represents to me the infinite space. Uh, and well, here I am. I sound like I'm reviewing the book or <laughs> I don't mean to, I don't want to go too far into it. I want to spoil it, but I, I, I was floored by this book. I have not been floored by a book before like this. And by the time I got to the end towards the, the last few pages, uh, and again, you know, it's described as the beginning and the end of the universe. And it really did feel like, the end of the universe. And it was very, very profound. And of course this, this probably has more of an effect on me now, given my situation and the experiences I've had in the past year and a half, you know? So this kind of stuff is sort of on my mind a little bit. And I'm, I'm I think I'm seeing the world a little bit through different glasses as it were different filters. I should say, I haven't picked up different glasses yet. Um, that, that this book, this introduction for me to Trent park is, is something on a level that I have not experienced with, with any other photographer. And, you know, I can see that his work is not for everybody. Right? It's not a, it's not, you, I think it's something that, you know, you need to, well, first, I think you have an open mind about it. Um, and, and actually have, have I started watching, I did watch a little documentary on him uh, and it was really interesting to hear him talk about, his experiences in life and uh, what he went through as a, um, as a young man in, in, in Australia and stuff like that with his family and stuff like that. And how that, how that affects his, his work. I think it's also very important if you get a chance to hear about a photographer and where they're coming from. It gives a lot of context to their work. It's, it's, you know, some people say, well, the work should just stand on their own. Sure. But when you've got a photographer, when you've got a story behind it, it adds so much more to it. So, um, I, I, I don't know what else to say about this book. I mean, I'd like, I'd like to, I'm going to put it on hold or on, on pause. Not, <laughs> I'm going to, Ward and I want to do an episode of Trump. We're gonna do a deep, I like to do a deep dive. He's got a few of Trent's books, right? These are the ones I could not get uh, because they're sold out and very expensive to buy. But I have this one, right? And so between the two of us, we've got enough that we can, we can probably do a, a dive on, on Trent Park and talk about him in a little bit more depth because we were asked to, uh, love to, you know, to talk about him, but you know, I, I don't know this, this work, this stuff, it's all black and white. It's all film, right? So it's very grainy. A lot of the pictures, um, the grain increases as you go further into the book, but I won't spoil that story, uh, at all. And, and again, that smell, this intense chemically printed ink smell. It's just, you know, Usually when you get a book and you smell it, it's like got that new book smell, but that team seems to not be part of the experience. I think this is in purpose. This feels like this whole book was, it, it really does feel like this is all on purpose. Everything here is on purpose, you know? So, um, I need to figure out what, what he's saying in these, in these braille printed pages that would be very interesting to find out. Uh, and of course I probably could go on the internet and find out someone already did it, but it'd be interesting to try to, to try to learn Braille, or at least sort of decode it myself without getting a, you know, without getting a, um, sort of a cheater on that. And that would, that would sort of tie into, you know, this thing that I'm doing with like writing and whatnot, you know, doing more writing, spending time. I mean, we all have this, you know, desire to, to, to learn stuff and we can just go on Google or something like that. And we can just press a button. I can go, you know, Trent Park's Braille, you know, transcribe, what is it? And, and find it out. And, you know, sure, I could do that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying, I, you know, I, I should not do that. But I'm also a little bit more interested in this sort of act of discovery. And that comes from, I believe that's coming a lot from spending more time writing and, uh, and slowing down my thought process. And it's not just a you know, it's not a coincidence that those things are happening simultaneously. So anyway, this book came in 
just the right time. I don't think I've got any other books. Oh, no, I do have another book on order. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, I, let me see what it is. It's not going to come until February, right? But it's, uh, let me just see my Amazon list here. Oh, it's a, it's a book on the history of photography, right? It's called Collaboration, a Potential History of Photography. So uh, that, that'll get in February and maybe I'll talk about that at some other point, but that's the only other book I've got on order. I promise <laughs> if I'm going to spend all my money you know, spending it on books is probably not a bad thing. So anyway, uh, so I, I think that's it. That's all I've got. I've got, uh, you know, we've got, uh, the end of the year coming up. We'll be doing our 200th episode cheesy. And I really was hoping to time that at the, um, you know, at the uh, end of the year, it would have been nice to start the January with the 200th episode or something like that. But that won't happen until the end of January, just the way things are working out. So, oh, well, you know, what What else? You know, it'll just work out. That. That's fine. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm missing. I'm missing Ward tonight. Uh, I'm hoping I did a, a good job on my own. I don't do that this often. I'm trying to be very loose and stuff. I'm also standing up, like I said, you know, on my desk so my cat doesn't jump up here. But I feel like it's, you know, this is a work thing. I can actually get more energy by standing up and talking to you guys. So, so that's about it for today. So let me give you where you can find Ward and me on the internets. Ward can be found on Vero and Twitter at WRosinPhoto. On Instagram at Ward Rosin Fine Arts. Facebook is Ward Rosin Photo. His website is rosin.ca, R O S I N.ca. And our unofficial sponsor is Ornis Photo, O R N I S. Photo, where you could find lens adapters and third party lenses for Sony and Fuji X. I hope I got that right, Ward. <laughs> But they're still our unofficial sponsor. We're going to turn into an official sponsor someday. And me, you can find me on Vero, Twitter, and Flickr at AM Rosario. Twitter. <laughs> Instagram now is at AM Rosario Photo. Website is amrosario.com. Our website is streetshots.photography. And if you could subscribe to our Substack newsletter at streetshots.substack.com. And if you like our content and want to help support the show, you can do so by buying me a coffee, buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Antonio Rosario. And in our show notes, I have a link to uh, our, my zines that I have. Ward and I um, are, are working on one zine. I'll put it up there. But if also you want to support the show, you can come and buy my zines. So, hey, yeah, until next time, everybody who is celebrating holidays, have a good holiday. You might be in the middle of a holiday right now as well when you're listening to this. So enjoy your holidays and let's uh, let's reconvene before the end of the year and we can make our resolutions and stuff like that. But anyway, thanks for hanging out with me and uh, we will. Uh, I'll see you uh, next time. Bye. <laughs>